this, ap this afternoon's lecture will feature uh, Franz Schubert's Piano Sonata in A Major, D959. I will be discussing cyclic and borrowed elements in this sonata. First, I would like to give a brief introduction of the composer. Franz Schubert was born in Vienna, Austria on January 31st, 1797 and died at age 31 on November 19, 1828. He was not well-traveled. He spent most of his life in Vienna, though he did occasionally visit the Hungarian countryside and a few places in Austria. He received formal music education in Vienna and also studied under Antonio Salieri, who was an authoritative figure of music at the time. Schubert's financial condition <coughs> is a topic for debate among musicologists, but I will hold the views given by Christopher H. Gibbs in his, as the editor of the Cambridge Companion Schubert and Susan, Susanna Clark, author of Analyzing Schubert. They agree that Schubert, though impoverished for a time, later received significant <coughs> popularity and was able to live off of his own publications by the early 1820s. A few highlights of his compositional output, he composed over 600 liter, 17 opera, six masses, nine symphonies, 35 chamber works, and 22 piano sonatas. Regarding his compositional style, he was known for his remarkable sense of lyricism and drama. And being a very lyrical composer, he was not as big on counter. He experimented with and pushed the boundaries of classical form, such as expanding the overall length of sonata form. And as Beethoven did in his sonatas number no. three and seven, he used three key expositions in some of his works, rather than the two key exposition, which was the convention of the time. The first movement of the sonata I will perform tonight is an example of a three key exposition. In many of Schubert's songs, the piano part goes beyond providing a simple accompaniment for the singer and has an equal part in expressing the meaning of the text. It can contain musical gestures that represent extra musical elements associated with the text or narrative of the song. This could include patterns that symbolize flowing water in a stream or wandering footsteps. Now I would like to mention the last three sonatas he composed because the sonata I will perform tonight is one of these. Um, they have many similarities. They were all composed in 1828, the year he died. They are all a four movement structure favored by Beethoven. The first movement being fast or moderately fast. The second movement is a slow. The third movement is usually in a dance form. And the fourth movement is either in sonata form or sonata rondo form. These three sonatas are also examples of cyclicism, having unifying elements to interconnect the movements. This is done through the use of motivic development, recurring motives that appear in multiple movements, and recurring harmonic progressions and melodic elements. These three sonatas also use unusual key relationships and modulate often to remote keys. Now we get to the discussion of cyclic and borrowed elements in this sonata. The information in this discussion is supported by the research of, of Charles Fisk and Charles Rosen. These are sourced at the end of your handout. First, the cyclic elements. I put these into three types. The first is non-melodic motives, then melodic motives, and other cyclic elements, including things like harmonic progressions and melodic fragments. I will explain these types as I continue. The first type, non-melodic motives, are short recurring musical ideas that, are, that can be built on rhythms, articulations, and other musical gestures. They have no set relationship of pitch or interval. The first two examples of non-melodic motives appear in the first measures of this piece. These are called motive X and motive Y, circled in red. Motive X and Y are also in your handout in the first example. Motive X is a two-note motive 
in which two notes jump apart an octave or more. And mode of Y is a two is a, is two chords with a short long rhythm. I will play mode of X. Another non-melodic motive appears in the first movement. It's called motive Z. This is a three-note motive with the rhythm short, short, long. I will demonstrate it for you. I would like to provide a few more examples of motive Z from the first movement. Here are two instances of it. The instance on the left, as you can see, the first two notes are staccato, while the second note rises up a half step. And the second one, they are not staccato. Another example, in the top instance, is three repeated notes with no change of pitch. And in the bottom example, we have third intervals and then a fourth interval. And the first notes are accented. So as you can tell, it doesn't matter what articulation or what pitch they're on, as long as they have the same rhythmic values. Now we move on to melodic motives. These are short, recurring musical ideas built on a series of intervallic relationships and do not necessarily adhere to a set of rhythmic values. If you will see um, example two in your handout, the first motive is called motive A. It is built on the scale degrees 5, 6, 5, 2. And it sometimes appears with additional notes in between. This motive first appears built into the second theme of the first movement. Here are the four notes of the motive. And here they are in this example. Another melodic motive is called motive B. It is a two note motive descending by half step and sometimes appears with embellishments in between. Here are the two notes of motive B. And now from this example.
example from the opening of the third movement. In this example, we see circled in red the two chords separated by an octave represent motive X, and the two chords circled in green are motive Y. Allow me to demonstrate motive X and Y from the first movement. One, seven, four, and one. 
It appears, again, at the very end of the last movement in retrograde order, in reverse, which means that the first chord is now the last chord, and so on. To make this more clear, I will play just the right hand chords from the first movement in the top example. from the bottom example in reverse order, starting from the right and going left. This harmonic progression appears one more time partially fulfilled at the end of the second movement in also retrograde order, and this time in the minor. Once again, here's our chords from the first movement. And now just listen as I play the bottom example as written. considered cyclic from this passage in the bottom example is the arpeggiated figure itself. These rolled chords reappear right at the beginning of the third movement. They are thematically transformed from a dark minor mood in the bottom example in the beginning of the third movement into a lighthearted dance. I will demonstrate these for you. First, the bottom example from the second movement. And now from the third movement in the top example. the discussion of cyclic elements in the sonata. Now we will look at borrowed elements from other musical works. As some of you may or may not know, Schubert borrowed musical ideas from Beethoven. Did you also know that he borrowed from himself? It's a tragedy using your own stuff, right? So first we will look at the evidence concerning Beethoven. This diagram shows the rondo forms between Beethoven's Sonata No. 16 in G major, Op. 31 No. 1, the third movement, Ms. Schubert's Sonata. We see a similar choice of key, except for the development section. And the interesting thing here is that between the recapitulation and the coda, the A material is restated in fragments with, with long pauses in between for a special effect. The, uh, here are the themes from each sonata. They start off innocently enough, 
But when the themes are restated a second time, in Beethoven's, for example, the theme moves to the left hand with a bass line underneath and triplet figures in the right hand. Schubert does the same in his sonata when the theme is repeated. The theme moves to the top of the left hand with a bass line underneath and triplets in the right hand. First, I will demonstrate the example from Beethoven, beginning at the red arrow. <coughs> And now the example from Schubert, beginning where the red arrow is. As I mentioned before, both sonatas restate the eighth theme in fragments before the coda. In Beethoven's example, you see circled in red long pauses breaking up the, the entrances of the A theme, which eventually leads to the coda marked presto at the red arrow. Schubert does the same. He breaks up his A theme with many pauses, followed then by the coda into a presto. First, I will demonstrate Beethoven's example beginning in the fourth movement of this example, the pickup into the fifth movement, into the fifth measure. Sonata, reminiscent of Beethoven's, is in the fourth movement. It's similar to this passage from Beethoven's Piano Sonata, number 14, opus 27, number 1. I'm sorry, number 2. We see a three voice texture, the melody in the top, accompanied by a triplet figure underneath, and a bass voice under that. If we look at the example from the fourth movement, Schubert Sonata, we see a similar three voice texture with the melody on top and a triplet figure accompanied by <clears throat> the bass voice in the bottom. Both of these examples are in C sharp major. Though Beethoven's example begins in C, minor, C sharp minor, it ends up in C sharp major. I will play these examples together for you, beginning with the example from Beethoven.
the example from Schubert's sonata. I will begin in the second measure of this example. This is also example 7A and 7B. 